Man. All right. Um, Sunday morning, I want to um, just mention that on Sunday morning, we're actually not going to be in Romans. We'll still be doing our prophecy update, but uh, the Lord has directed me uh, in to the book of Second Kings, and for good reason, and uh, so uh, very exciting uh, reasons, and so just want to uh, let you know that Sunday morning you're in for, I hope, a real treat with what the Lord is doing uh, and may in fact do uh, here in this small, obscure church in Kaneohe. So uh, I can't tell you anymore. You can torture me. You can tie my hands together so my fingernails grow into my palms. You can waterboard me. You can, you know, sleep deprive me so I go insane, and I will not tell you until Sunday morning. Ruth chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 19, and we're going to make it all the way, Lord willing, I've got to preface it with Lord willing, to chapter 2. Verse 1, only one verse in chapter 2. Actually, we <laughs> had only made it to verse 18 last week, so we're going to actually pick it up now in the middle of the narrative. Uh, but I think I should take just a little bit of time <clears throat> bring you up to speed with where we're at uh, here in Ruth 1. Uh, but before we do, let's uh, go to the throne and ask the Lord's blessing on our time in His Word. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this building that we can meet in and open up our Bibles in and have this Bible study in in the middle of a week. Lord, we're so thankful to You for this time. It's for us a time that we can set aside all the cares and the affairs of this life, all the busyness of the week, of the day, and just settle our hearts and focus our attention upon you and that which you would desire to minister to us in your word. So Lord, will you? We're asking you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, we began with Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons moving from Bethlehem in Judah to Moab because there was a famine in the land. Once they get there, sadly, Elimelech dies. And their two sons, Mahlan and Kilian, marry Moabite wives by the name of Orpah and Ruth. But as it would turn out, both of the sons would also end up dying as well, leaving what is now three <clears throat> widows behind, one of which is Naomi and the other two, Orpah and Ruth. So 10 years go by, and Naomi hears that the Lord has provided bread to his people back home in Bethlehem, so she makes the decision to go back home. Thinking that the hand of the Lord is against her, and because she wants her daughters-in-law to have a better chance of finding husbands to provide for them, she virtually begs them to not follow her to Bethlehem. She pleads with them to go back to Moab. Interestingly, initially, they both refuse. And this because of their love and loyalty to their mother-in-law, Naomi. However, Orpah finally acquiesces and ends up returning 
to Moab, never to be heard from again. But Ruth not only follows Naomi, but we're told in the text she clings to her. And in what is arguably one of the most beautiful and powerful passages in all of the Bible, she swears her allegiance to Naomi, to Naomi's people, and to Naomi's God, till death do they part. And so she's committed, and she follows Naomi into Bethlehem. That's where we pick it up now in verse 19. Now, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And, pardon me, the woman said, Is this Naomi? But, verse 20, she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitter, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now, we did touch on these last week, but I wanted to start here this week for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that some commentators suggest Naomi had become bitter towards the Lord. And it's evidenced by how she says, no longer call me Naomi, which means pleasant and plenty. Instead, call me, because the name is the nature, is it not? Instead, call me more accordingly to my nature, and so call me Mara, or bitter, instead. So the commentators, for the most part, believe that Naomi had become embittered. And even in her bitterness, she had become bitter towards the Lord. Now, that in fact may very well be true, but I want to offer what I believe is perhaps a better fit to the narrative in that I'm more inclined to see Naomi as simply expressing to her people how that for the last 10 years in Moab, she has drunk from the bitter cup of the death of not only her husband, but her two sons. Now, maybe I'm um, more forgiving of Naomi not being bitter because I've tasted from a similar cup having experienced the death of a child. So maybe I'm a little more sensitive to that which she's wanting to communicate to her people, I think that just because she's drunk from this bitter cup of their deaths doesn't necessarily mean that she's become bitter towards the Lord. I mean, we can be the recipient of bitter circumstances and unspeakable pain and unthinkable difficulty, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to, as a result of it, become bitter towards the Lord. Now here's how I get there. Rather than forsaking the Lord, she's still following the Lord, is she not? I mean, wouldn't it stand to reason that if she was really bitter towards the Lord, that she would not go back home to Bethlehem. Rather, she would probably be more likely to stay in Moab and continue to nurse the bitterness. I'm not going back there. Are you kidding me? No, she's still following the Lord, and she's even trusting the Lord in spite of all that's happened to her. I think of Job, who would say, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. I think Naomi would say, though he afflict me, yet will I follow him. Here's another reason I believe this. 
It's because of the utter shock that she's met with from her people back home in Bethlehem who haven't seen her for the last 10 years. Now understand, there's nothing in the text that would indicate that their response to her in not recognizing her by virtue of how they asked, is that Naomi? Oh my goodness, I didn't recognize her. Wow, she's really aged. The utter shock of her people when they see her is not based on what comes out of her mouth. It's based on what they see outwardly. The lines in her faces perhaps deeper. The hair now on her head perhaps grayer. The look on her face perhaps more somber and sober having gone through all that she's been through in the last 10 years. Well, I'll tell you, losing a husband and two sons, I mean, let, let's be honest, that, that would really tax a heavy toll, would it not? I mean, you know, you, you, you look at people and you look at their faces and I like to call them character lines. Why are you laughing? <laughs> I, though, listen, I, I earned every single one of these lines on my face, I'll have you know. <laughs> the, the, this gray hair, listen, I earned every single one of those hairs. I'm just glad I still have hairs to be gray. But I believe that it was chiefly her outward appearance bearing those bitter scars that would prompt her to say to them, no longer call me Naomi. I don't look very pleasant. Uh, I don't look like a Naomi. I know that as you see me and you're shocked to see what the years have done to me. (laughs) Instead, it would be more fitting to call me Mara. Here's another thing. If she was really bitter towards the Lord, I believe they would have said something like, oh my goodness, Naomi. We're not going to call you Naomi anymore. We're going to call you Mara. And I say that because she would have maybe said something inwardly that would expose that she had become bitter towards the Lord. Instead, it's not them saying it to her, it's her saying it to them, which tells me, just logically, that this was based on her appearance outwardly. Here's the reason that actually seals the deal for me. I just cannot fit into the narrative, and I have an extremely hard time believing that if she was really bitter towards the Lord, uh, Ruth wouldn't want to have anything to do with her. I mean, can I just ask you, think about this. I know that you all know of at least one person in your life that is bitter and just has a root of bitterness and it's defiling. Can I ask you this question? Do you enjoy being around with them? Being around them? Do you want to go to lunch with them? Do you want to follow them to Bethlehem? Do you want to swear your allegiance to them till death do you part? (laughs) Uh, Do you want to swear your allegiance not only to them, but to their God? Listen, this is maybe one of the reasons why we have such a difficult time getting non-believers to 
want to hear us share with them about the Lord. I mean, they look at us and they look at our lives and, oh my goodness, they, they don't want to follow us. I mean, we invite them to church and, and then we proceed to just spew out all of these things. We murmur, we complain. No wonder <laughs> they don't want to have anything to do with us and or our God. So again, if Naomi's bitter towards the Lord, uh, Ruth isn't, she's going back to Moab with Orpah, and for good reason. You go on ahead, Mara, <laughs> bitter, a.k.a. formerly known as Naomi, <laughs> pleasant. You go on ahead to Bethlehem. I wish you the best. Another reason I believe that she's not bitter towards the Lord is because of what we read next in verse 21 and what she says to them. In verse 21, she says, I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the, now listen, since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Now, stay with me. A couple of thoughts here. First, notice how that Naomi, when she says she left full, but the Lord brought her back empty, is explaining to them that her wealth was not in her worldly possessions. She didn't leave Bethlehem to go to Moab 10 years earlier with a famine in the land with plenty, I can assure you. Well, what does she mean, I left full? She left full. She had a husband. She had two sons. And she came back empty. No husband. No two sons. You have to understand, in the, in the Middle East, even to this day, your, your net worth does not determine your self-worth. Let me say the same thing a different way. Your wealth in the Middle East is not determined by your worldly possessions. It's determined by how many sons you have. It's, it's determined by your family. You know what's interesting? And this is one of the things that was just really, um, for lack of a better word, gnarly for me when I would go back to the Middle East, to my people. <laughs> and I would have, you know, these dialogues with them, and they would not ask me, what do you do in America? What do you do for a living? That's what we ask people, right? You know, that's a real subtle way to find out, you know, uh, what category you're going to place them in. Well, I'm a doctor. Oh, right? Can we talk? <laughs> Let's be honest with each other, right? Because see, we base the person's value on what they do, not who they are. Not in the Middle East. You know what they asked me in the Middle East? Not what do you do, which I'm glad they didn't because I would have to tell them, oh, I'm a pastor and uh, you're a what? I'm a pastor. I like what Gail Irwin says, I work for the big three. Wow. <laughs> the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They don't ask me, what do you do? They ask me, who's your family? What family do you come from? Oh, and then I have to go into a conversation with them. My father, his last name is, oh, and they know the name. See, divorce over there, blended families. It, it, listen, if, if you're from there and you have a last name, they can pretty much tell from whose family you're, you're from. I tell them my mom's name and her family, and they all know who they are. They know the family name. And they base now who I am based on who my family is. And that's what is happening here with Naomi. I left full. 
I left with plenty, which is what Naomi means. But now I'm empty, barren, and I have drunk from a bitter cup. But secondly, she explains her affliction from the Lord. But notice what she doesn't say. She's not actually blaming of the Lord. She says, the Lord has afflicted me. The Lord has testified against me. But she doesn't say that she's testified against the Lord. It's not even a subtle hinting at the Lord has dealt unfairly with me. She says, the Lord's afflicted me, but nowhere is she even implying that the Lord has dealt unfairly with her. She's only explaining to them, oh my goodness, you guys, you have no idea what happened to me when I was there in Moab. I left here with my husband and my two sons, and I come back a widow with no more husband and no more sons. In that culture, that's huge. That's huge. You know, growing up, I had one sister, one sibling, younger sister. And my parents weren't actually planning on having a sibling for me. And, you know, you can't blame them. I, you know, I'm as an only child. But, uh, and actually, my name was my nature. Wahid in Arabic is the number one the only begotten son. In fact, in the Arabic Bible of Jesus, it will say, (laughs) Al-Wahid. How cool is that, man? (laughs) Okay, anyway. But, so, here's the thing. I I was Wahid, the only begotten son. And see, in the Arab culture, the son carries the family name, not the daughter. When a daughter is born there, and I'm speaking primarily of the Arab culture, it's, there's not as, let's just say kindly, there's not as much rejoicing as when a son is born. Because see, the son carries the family name. And the father is now named according to the son. So my firstborn son, Elias, I would be referred to affectionately in the Middle East as Abu Ilias, the father of Elias. It's more of an honor than calling me pastor. Pastor sure has honor, but you do me more honor by calling me Abu Ilias, the father of your firstborn son, Elias. That's how huge it was. So (laughs) she comes back, and I see it as her just explaining to them and communicating to them why she looks like she's aged 50 years in the last 10 years. You know, I was looking at a picture of me when we first moved here. And I was thinking, you know, my eyebrows are, were thicker. You know, my wife and I were, were getting ready to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary, our silver anniversary. You know, when I was young and someone would say, hey, that's their silver anniversary, I thought, man, they're old. Now it's me, right? A silver anniversary, 25 years. And so we're getting our old, you know, wedding pictures out and, oh my goodness, I had, I almost had a unibrow. They were so thick. <laughs> and now they're like Gone. And I didn't have as much forehead back then. And now it's like big now. The whole thing is big. And anyway. And, and I, I was look, but I was looking at pictures just from the last nine years since we moved here. And I tell you, the, and I'm not complaining. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm just explaining. The, the first couple years, especially after we moved here, were brutal. They were brutal. We, we moved here on December 7, 2003, and I was looking at pictures of me in 2004, the beginning of the year, and I still look pretty halfway. I wasn't as hideous as I am now. And I'm looking at a picture today, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, look at me. 
It's been 10 years like Naomi. I'm going to be going back to the mainland later on this year, and I'm expecting some friends that haven't seen me since I moved here to say, oh my good!" and I'm just going to say to them, no longer call me Wahid, call me Mara. <laughs> I'm not bitter, I just look rough, okay? I know I've got some miles on me, all right? That's what she's doing. She's explaining to them. Because they're, they're shocked. They're, they don't even recognize her. That's how much she's changed over the last 10 years because of the affliction. Again, I think of Job who said, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. So too is this true with Naomi. In effect, she's saying, I left full. The Lord gave me a husband. The Lord gave me two sons. But the Lord has taken them away. And I have come back empty. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Here's the thing. Like Job, she's not cursing God. She's not blaming God. In all of this, after you read through the entire book of Job, which reading the book of Job is not for wimps, by the way. You get through to the end of the book of Job, and it says of Job that in all of these things, he never cursed God, even when his wife told him to. I'm thinking, oh my... I'm not even going to go there. That's going to be a... Can you imagine your husband's, your wife coming to you? You're scraping the boils on your arms. And she says, why don't you just curse God and die and just get out of this misery? Well, how would you respond? I mean, listen, we read them as words on a page in our Bibles, but this really happened. This really happened. If you're Job, what would your response be? Get thee behind me, Satan, woman. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm going to curse God and, and die? Listen, the way that Naomi shares this with them, so as to explain this to them, she in no way even so much as hints at God being the blame for what's happened, for this bitter cup that she has. We do err when we share our afflictions with others in such a fashion that we indirectly badmouth God. You know what I mean by that? Let me take it a step further. We do that when we not only badmouth God, but poor mouth God. Now let me explain. Pastors are the worst at this. Well, I'm a pastor, I should get a discount. You know, on the mainland, we, at the church that I pastored there, this is back in the cassette tape days. You young people, never mind. It's a plastic cartridge with, anyway. And we didn't do what we do here. We, here, you know, we make the CDs just available to you, and, you know, there's no charge. But on the mainland, we, we charged people. I forget what the price was. But um, because this is such a big deal to me, and this is one of my pet peeves, I made a point of paying the same price for my own teaching tapes that everybody else paid. We had a bookstore. I paid the same price for the books and the merchandise in our bookstore that everybody else paid for. And I made a point of doing that. I, I don't want a poor mouth God. That's why you'll never hear as a trailer on any of our radio or TV broadcasts any plea for money. By the way, have you noticed lately that sometimes we don't even mention the agape box? For those of you who were here on Resurrection Sunday, I just sense from the Lord, don't mention 
the agave box, and I didn't. I just, I don't want people to get the impression that God has been hit by the recent financial crisis that is the worst since the Great Depression. You know, when a pastor gets on the radio and says, you know, you need to give if you want to keep this broadcast on the air. Oh, my flesh wants to call them and say to them, hey, buddy, <laughs> hey, buckaroo. <laughs> Is that a bad word? I hope not. I just used it. <laughs> Did it ever dawn on you that if you need money to keep the broadcast on the air, and you have to beg for money and poor mouth God in the process of doing it that maybe you're not supposed to be on the air? <laughs> See, to bad mouth God or to poor mouth God is to testify against God. And to testify against God is to say that you're blaming God if you're going to testify, what you're saying is that God is unjust. And you're going to testify to that. Naomi's not doing that. You know, a good example of this is when Aaron was told to keep silent when God struck and killed his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, on the spot spot, man. You know, two sons, just like Naomi. Only, <laughs> I mean, God literally killed them on the spot. And can you imagine, God says to Aaron, I don't want you to mourn. I don't want you to weep. I don't want you to have any public show of mourning. It's Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3. Let me read it. Then Nadab and Abhu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, listen, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace, said nothing. Can you imagine how hard that must have been for Aaron not to express outward grief over the death of his, his two sons? We're told he did. Were he not to do this, he could have bad-mouthed God. And with this public display of mourning and weeping, he would basically be saying, God is harsh. God is unjust by killing them were he to weep over them. In other words, if Aaron, as their high priest, had been bitter because of this, or outwardly mourned over this, he would have blamed God for doing this. Listen, I, I don't want to belabor this, but maybe someone needs to hear this. Be very careful with how you represent God. Well, pastor, I, I, it's been really rough lately. Are you blaming God for what's happened to you? Is God to blame? Is God dealing unfairly with you? What if he were to slay you? Would you yet praise him? 
What if he were to take away that which he's given you, would you still follow him? I think of Moses when he misrepresented God before the children of Israel. God said, speak to the rock. He'd already struck the rock, but the Israelites were complaining because they were thirsty. And so God says to Moses, speak to the rock and I will provide water. Water will come forth. Well, Moses got angry and it was an unrighteous anger. And in his anger, he says to the Israelites, how long shall we, translated, me and God, because we're like this. In other words, he was placing himself at the same level of God. How long shall we put up with you? And in his anger, he struck the rock, and God still provided water to come forth. But afterwards, he forbid Moses because of it, because he had misrepresented who God is. God's not angry. I imagine, boy, I would have hated to have been in that meeting, that emergency meeting with God and Moses. God calls him, hey, Mo, get over here, boy. What's this we stuff? Why are you so angry? I'm not angry. Why did you strike the rock? Speak to the rock. It's the typology, of course. The rock is Christ. He's only struck once on the cross. And after the cross, we speak. And out comes the water of life. That's the typology. So he ruined the typology. But I believe more importantly, he misrepresented God. Oof. Scary, especially for pastors and teachers. Because we're going to be judged by a higher standard when it comes to how did we represent God. I think it is very dangerous for us to even hint at the notion that God has dealt unfairly with you. Oh, maybe he's given you a bitter cup, a cup of suffering. But if you even so much as hint at that cup being unfair, you are bad-mouthing God, you are blaming God, and you are misrepresenting God. And God takes that very seriously. We better keep moving here. <clears throat> Verse 22 so, <clears throat> pardon me, Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, this is how the chapter ends, but interesting to note this barley harvest. This will prove to be germane to our understanding of the perfect timing of God. Listen, it's been said that God is never late, but God is never early either. And if the truth be known, we don't want him to be early. Because if he's early, then it will thwart all that God has in his perfect timing. His timing is always perfect. Can you imagine if Naomi, with Ruth in tow, would have come to Bethlehem, not 10 years later at the time of the barley harvest, but 11 years later, we wouldn't have a book of Ruth in our Bibles. Can you imagine if they'd have come earlier, nine years instead of 10, and not at the barley harvest? None of this would have happened. We're about to witness as we get into chapter 2, a remarkable and beautiful and marvelous display of God's perfect providence. I mean, down to the gnat's eyebrow. And yes, gnats have eyebrows. <laughs> she has no idea about God's timing. For such a time as this, if I can borrow from another book about another woman 
by the name of Esther. Before we get into chapter 2, which we will get to, I want for us to take just a moment to take a most fascinating look at how the name is the nature, just in what we've studied thus far. To me, it sort of tells a story. And it's not just Naomi's and Ruth's story, it's our story too. Now, first let me give you the meanings of the names, and then we'll connect the dots. Elimelech means God is my king. Bethlehem means house of bread. This is the same in the Arabic as it is in the Hebrew. Beit is house, lehem, bread. Naomi means pleasant or plenty. Mara means bitter. The two sons, Mahlan, Kilian, sickly and ailing. Ailing, carrying with it the idea of deteriorating health. Orpa, stiff-necked, literally, yeah. <laughs> well, that explains a lot, doesn't it? No, literally half-necked. In other words, stiff-necked. Ruth, friendship. What is part and parcel of friendship? Loyalty, kinship. Judah, Bethlehem and Judah means praise. Now, with that understanding, here's what I'm thinking. God is my king. He will always provide my daily bread. I shall never be in want. He, my king, can turn bitter to sweet. If in pleasant times of plenty, or when I drink from the cup of bitter suffering, or even when I'm ailing and confined to a bed of sickness and suffering, I will still follow him. When adversity strikes, I will not become bitter. I will not stiffen my neck, but rather I will humble my heart and forever praise Him, for He has called me His friend. Charles Spurgeon of this says, Naomi, whose name means pleasantness, or sweetness shows to us how God can soon change our sweets into bitters. She left full. Therefore, let us be humble. But He can with equal ease transform our bitters into sweets. Therefore, let us be hopeful. It is very usual for Naomi and Mara, sweet and bitter, to meet in the same person. He who was called Benjamin, or the son of his father's right hand, was first called Benoni, remember? Or the son of sorrow. The comforts of God's grace are all the sweeter when they follow the troubles of life. Listen, Naomi's story, Ruth's story, speaks to our lives, especially for those of us who are having a difficult time and experiencing those trials in our lives. You'll see. Yes, it seems that everything is against you, Yes, it seems that the Lord has testified against you. Yes, it seems that the Lord has afflicted you, but He can turn that bitter into sweet 
as Spurgeon says, with ease. Have you ever had a situation in your life where it seems like overnight, with a stroke of a pen, or the click of a mouse, if you prefer, God just changed the complexion of that trial in your life. I think of the Psalms that says, weeping lasts for the night, but rejoicing returns in the morning. His mercies are new every morning. God, like that, can change everything. And he's about to with Naomi and Ruth at this specific time during the barley harvest. Oh, I can't wait. If they only knew what God was going to do. I wait. Can't we just tell them? Oh, if I, listen, if they knew what you were going to do, God, it would make it a lot easier for them to get through this, you know, trial. Don't you wish that sometimes God, who knows the end from the beginning, would let you in on it? Listen, how about on the tail end, on, in hindsight, you look back at that suffering, that trial, that painful ordeal in your life, and then you're sitting here just rejoicing. God is blessing you. And don't you just wish that maybe God could have just said back then, you know, it's kind of one of those things, well, if, if I only knew then what I know now, it would have made then a lot easier to get through knowing what I had on the tail end of it. But is that not where faith comes in? Listen, sight is the antithesis of faith. And I can't find anywhere in my Bible, though I wish I could, where it says that we can walk by sight and be pleasing to God. No, without faith, it is impossible to please God, the writer of Hebrews says. I think that God is delighted. He is so pleased when we just trust Him. God, I don't know how you're going to... I've lost my husband. I've lost my two sons. I've, I've lost everything. And I've got the scars to prove it. Just ask my friends. Listen, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how you're going to bring good from this, but by faith, I know that. I know that. I don't know when you're going to do it. I hope it's soon. <laughs> Please. <laughs> don't let it be too long. <laughs> I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know the way you're going to do it. I don't even know where you're going to do it. But by faith, I know that. You're going to do it because you said you would. And you are a God of your word. You cannot break your word. And you've given me your word that you'll work everything together for the good. If I'm called according to your purpose. And if I love you and serve you and walk with you. You have promised me that you'll do it. But you have not promised me that you'll tell me the when, the where, the way, the how. That you're going to do it. That's where faith comes in. That's where faith comes in. Let's, uh, verse 1, chapter 2. This is as far as we're going to get. We're actually going to read verses 2 and 3, but we'll pick it up in verse 2, Lord willing, next week. Verse 1 says, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. What a coincidence. <laughs> I hope you don't believe that. It's not coincidence, it's providence. A man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. I want to draw your attention to this word relative. Uh, it's important to note that the word here used for relative in the New King James is rendered in the King James kinsman. That's a game changer. It's the Hebrew word goel. And the reason that this is so significant 
is because Goel can be translated as both kinsman and redeemer, and as such points to this kinsman redeemer and, more importantly, in typology to the person of Jesus Christ, who is our kinsman redeemer. Leviticus 25 verse 25 tells us what the kinsman redeemer is and what the kinsman redeemer can do. It says, if one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative, there's that word relative again, the kinsman redeemer comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. Enter Boaz, whom we're introduced to right out of the chute here in verse 1. See, this meant that Boaz, as a kinsman redeemer, Goel, could buy the land and possessions in the event that one of his kinsmen had fallen on hard times. In other words, if they owed a debt they could not pay, sound familiar? The kinsman redeemer could redeem them by purchasing it or redeeming it for them and instead of them. Now, the kinsman redeemer is beautifully illustrated, <clears throat> pardon me, in the person of Boaz and prophetically and ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. F.B. Meyer says it best this way. In the case of Naomi, this was Boaz. In our case, it is Jesus Christ. Redemption, as described in Leviticus 25, had to do with persons and lands, and each illustrates Christ's work on behalf of believers throughout all the ages. He has redeemed our persons. It often happened that a Hebrew waxed poor and was compelled to sell himself to some wealthy Gentile who sojourned in the land. He, who had owned his own patrimony, now wrought as a bondservant for another. But after he had sold himself, he might be redeemed by his next kinsman. So we had sold ourselves for naught. We wrought the will of the flesh. We were enslaved to the fashions of this world. We obeyed the promptings of the prince of the power of the air. Alas for us, but we have been redeemed, not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. We have been made free by right and have only to claim and act upon the freedom with which the risen Christ has made us free. He has redeemed our inheritance. What we lost in the first Adam, we have more than regained in the second. For innocence, we have purity. For external fellowship with God, His indwelling. For the delights of an earthly paradise, the fullness of God's blessedness and joy. He is our next kinsman, my brother, my sister. He says of each who will do the will of the Father. He has made himself one with us by taking on himself our nature and identifying himself with our race. We know that Jesus, our Goel and Redeemer, liveth, and that He will come to redeem us from the power of the grave and receive us to Himself. I love the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. Because, see, the Old Testament points to the New Testament. I know that's deeply profound, but think about it. It's been said that the Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. What does the New Testament reveal? The New Covenant. What does it reveal? It reveals the finished work on the cross, paid in full, our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ, all of our sins, our goel, the 
whole of the Old Testament points to the person of Jesus Christ. And Ruth is the most glorious of examples, is it not? Well, let's read verses 2 and 3, and we'll try to bring it in for a landing. Again, we're just going to read the verses. And I'm doing this because I want to give you just sort of a a teaser, a, a taste of what's ahead in the remainder of this amazing book containing only four chapters. You want to sound really hyper-spiritual? Just tell your friends who don't really know the Old Testament, say, man, I read the entire book of Ruth, man. Wow, did, how long did it take you? Uh, what time is it now? About 30 minutes. What do you mean? Oh, it's only four chapters. You can do that with a New Testament book of James. Well, you can do that with a lot of New Testament books, but it makes it sound like, wow, you read the whole book of Ruth, dude. <laughs> what a book. Four chapters, that's all you need. Four chapters. What a book. What a book. Can I just let you kind of see what's in store for us in these four chapters? <laughs> of course I can. It's a beautiful, prophetic painting on the canvas of our redemption by our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Now, this is just a thumbnail sketch. It gets better, believe you me. <laughs> In chapter 1, verse 19, we're told, So the two women, speaking of Ruth and Naomi, went on until they came to Bethlehem, and they came at the barley harvest, the feast of harvest. That's what they were celebrating at the very time that Ruth and Naomi entered Bethlehem. This is so cool. Do you know that to this day in Israel, the Jews read the book of Ruth during the feast of harvest about Naomi, a Jew, and Ruth, a Gentile? Oh, this is just the beginning. Just the beginning. In chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, which is why, again, I read them, Naomi says to her, go ahead. So she went out to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, that's an understatement, just so happened, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. She has no idea. This is her kinsman redeemer, vis-à-vis -vis Elimelech, because he was from the tribe of Elimelech. And so that's when and where and why she meets Boaz, the lord of the harvest. Elimelech's brother, Naomi's deceased husband, is how she meets through Naomi, the Lord of the harvest. She's a Gentile. And Deuteronomy 25 allows this Lord of the harvest, Boaz, this kinsman redeemer, to fulfill the kinsman law and buy the field and marry this Gentile bride of this man's son, to carry on the name, as was the practice in that day, and even to this day in some places. Chapter 4, verse 13. So, Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now, the field is a type of the world. You know the parables that Jesus taught? The field is a type of the world. The world, the field, is bought by the next of kin. Jesus purchased the world with his blood as the kinsman redeemer. He became man next to us. A kinsman. A man of kin. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Be redeemed and have everlasting life. 
It's his love for the bride. You know that, listen, young people, this, this is a great love story. Listen, some of the television shows have nothing on Ruth, man. I mean, this, this Boaz, dare I say it like this, you'll forgive me. Man, he, he's hitting on her. As soon as he finds out, he asks, who is she in my field? Oh, hey, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's hitting on her, man. He's going to find out who she is. And then he's like really nice to her. And, and she's like, why do you even notice me? I'm a Moabitess. And you, they are in love, man. They are in love. I don't know if it's love at first sight, but he loves her. It's a great love story. I just had to share that. I feel better. It's just so cool. <laughs> In the next verse, verse 14 of chapter 4, we're told that the woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. You have no idea. Boaz, a type of Christ, is the kinsman redeemer who so loved Ruth that he gave her a son so she would not be left without the seed, keeping the name throughout life. And yes, this name, the only name given amongst men whereby we might be saved, his name is Jesus, and he is famous throughout all the world. Last one, verse 16 of chapter 4. Now this is cool, and I know that you are going to understand why I would um, save the best for last. But would you believe me if I told you that in the book of Ruth, we have forensic evidence proving that the rapture is before the seven-year tribulation. Okay. Verse 16. Then not, now think this through with me. Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. And the woman, woman living there said, Naomi has a son. Wait a minute. That, that's, isn't that Ruth's and Boaz's son? No, no. Naomi has a son. And they named him Abed. You know what his father's name was? Jesse. You know who Jesse was the father of? Oh, King David. From whom would come the Savior of the world. Now, Here's the typology. The child is now embraced in the lap of Naomi. Who is Naomi a type of Israel? The Jews. And Ruth, the Gentile bride, isn't seen again in the scriptures. A picture of us, the Gentile bride of Christ. Remember we talked about Moses and his Gentile bride? Joseph and his Gentile bride, and every single one of them are not heard of when the seven-year famine, when the tribulation comes, the bride is not mentioned. And such is the case with Ruth. After the son is placed in the lap of Israel, the Gentile bride is not mentioned anymore. And from that son would come from the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Savior of the world. <laughs> Listen, sometimes I just feel like I am so inadequate at even beginning to scratch the surface of everything that is in the book of Ruth. Listen, as God is my witness, I have studied this book, I have taught this book, and it is every single time it just leaps off the page. It's like, oh! 
I mean, it's like, no way, no way. Is that not what God's Word is? Active, alive. It comes to life. It is life. It's the Word of life, the bread of life. This is life. I, the book of Ruth, who would have thunk? Who would have thunk? The book of, what could possibly be in the book of Ruth for me? Hey, you know, next time someone says, hey, what, what, what you know, what'd you do Thursday night? I went to church. You went to church? Well, what'd you do there? Well, we studied God's word. You did? Yeah, the book of Ruth. The book of what? Is that in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Old Testament. The Old Testament? Isn't the Old Testament old? <laughs> oh, <laughs> New every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Why don't you all stand? Father, (laughs) thank you. Thank you for Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Thank you for the profound portrait here in the book of Ruth a foreshadow of you as our Goel. Lord, thank you that you can turn bitter to sweet. Lord, thank you that your timing is perfect. Thank you that we are redeemed. Thank you for this hope that we have by faith. In Jesus' name, amen.